just one you know, final question on sort of Shanghai. Who should I think of as ultimately driving the local development decisions in the city? How should I think about the, the process of skyscraper building that is so you know, radically changed uh, Pudong? Where's, where's the energy coming from? To what extent is it bottom up entirely? To what extent is there top down motion on this? It's a highly planned city. Uh, it's, a, it's a city that doesn't exist without enormous amounts of state investment. Mm -hmm. So it's not primarily in its initial uh, rebuilding from the 1990s on. It is not primarily private enterprise, but state enterprise that leads to the construction of buildings and other things that would house private enterprise, that would house uh, individuals, and so on. So you have uh, kind of a macro city plan, but then you have cities within cities. Uh, so it's a city, you, know, uh, you can go to the Minhang district in southwest Shanghai that most of our learners will never have been. It, it's a small place of about three million people, <laughs> maybe more, mm -hmm. I, I could get that wrong. The last time I talked to the party secretary there, he was in the process of building 21 new hospitals uh, for this area, huge investment in public health and in infrastructure and in education, uh, a lot of that district driven in this, of course with the permission of the overall city government and with the oversight of the overall city government. But this is a big and complicated place of more than 20 million people in which you have significant decisions being made on the local basis. I'll give you an example. When we went to register our office, Harvard University's mm -hmm. office in Shanghai, now our center in Shanghai, I was told by our lawyers here at Harvard, uh, everything is fine, but you just can't use uh, the name Harvard because there's already a Harvard University registered in Shanghai. <laughs> it's just not us. Of course, and I said, yeah. come on, we're Harvard, they're not. Uh, and I did a little bit of research, and uh, you know, Harvard University uh, in Chinese is Hafo, Hafo Dasha. And this place had registered as Hafo Te Dasha, so an extra character, so mm. definitely not us. How to get registered, nevertheless. We spent all this money on lawyers, Chinese lawyers, American lawyers, all money down the drain. Uh, and I finally took out to lunch uh, the uh, vice mayor of the district in which we wanted to be registered, who, by good fortune, was an old friend, a wonderful historian from the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, now uh, serving in politics, and, and a wonderful leader in every dimension. Mm -hmm. And I explained to him what we were doing. We had a lovely lunch, a very nice bottle of wine, mm -hmm. and within 72 hours, we were registered. <laughs> And so the local government really matters even in very big cities. Sure. The Harvard office is in the Pudong district, yes. right? Um, which in some sense is glorious visually, but certainly when you experience it as a pedestrian, it, yes. it, feels, it feels like a city that's built for skyscrapers rather than people, as Absolutely. opposed to Nanjing Road, which you know, comes alive with just you know, right. human traffic of, of people dancing, people playing games on the street, and you really feel like it's a city built on a, on a human scale, whereas Pudong doesn't have that yet. Doesn't, really. have, doesn't have it yet. And of course, it's the great thing about Puxi, about the older part of Shanghai, it is a fabulous walking city. Right. Uh, and so many things to explore and to find in different alleyways and, and different pathways. Whereas Pudong is, of course, built as a city of boulevards, but huge boulevards, Soviet style almost, big urban planning operation. It's improving, I should tell mm -hmm. you. Uh, now there are the beginning of walkways between buildings. My guess is if in another 10 or 15 years, Pudong is going to look like parts of Hong Kong. You right. know, when you're in Hong Kong, you never set foot Absolutely. on the sidewalk uh, anymore because it's too dangerous, uh, and it doesn't get you where you want to go and fast. And you it's walk not air conditioned. And it's not air conditioned, yeah. so you walk above the city. My guess is that at least in the kind of financial area of uh, Pudong, you'll begin. To, some of this has already started. Yeah, you'll you'll see changes there, but it doesn't have that street life, that right. vibrancy, that extraordinary energy of the other side of the river. Right, and, and you're probably right. Shanghai will probably move to, to a case in which there's street life, but it's just streets are, are above ground in some, in some way, like, like Hong Kong. Let me give you one of, of urban planning. Uh, uh, one of the, f when the Pudong New District was opened up, the first investor in it was an overseas Chinese company called the CP Group, the Zheng Da Jituan, the CP Group, this huge agribusiness, Thai Chinese company, and Deng Xiaoping gave uh, Mr. Chairman Danin investor num the number, investor number 001. So this is the national government giving huge face to this uh, Chinese investor. And he builds this huge mall, the super brand mall, 
uh, on the Huangpu River, right there. And why does he build it where he built it? That's because the ferry goes there. Mm -hmm. There are no bridges, there are no tunnels at this point, and he builds this enormous mall. And then it shows you that one hand often doesn't know what the other hand is doing in China. The local government moves the ferry. <laughs> <laughs> and the mall goes nearly bankrupt, uh, although it's brought back to life by excellent management from the CP group. And now mm -hmm. it's an extraordinarily vibrant place because you can get there by subway, sure. by, by any number of other, of, sure. of other means. So when people think of China sometimes as a perfectly planned environment, this is uh, not always the case. Indeed, it never, it never is.